Ladies and gentlemen, shalom again from Israel. Thank you for uh, joining in. This is a special uh, session following the Iranian attack on Israel uh, last night. Uh, this session is titled the Iranian attack on Israel, initial insights and uh, possible ramifications. Starting with uh, some very short uh, descriptions of last night um, attack on Israel, which I'm quite sure that you're all familiar with. Uh, you could see to the right hand side the statistics of the uh, cruise missiles, um, uh, 36 cruise missiles, 185 uh, attacking drones and 110 ballistic missiles, surface to surface missiles that were launched from Iran by the Iranians. 99% of these missiles, uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and drones were intercepted by uh, Israeli Air Force, Israeli Defense System, the United States, the UK, um, France, and um, reportedly Jordan uh, as well. Overwhelmingly, most of those incoming threats, challenges, were intercepted away from uh, Israeli um, sovereign territory. Uh, however, some 10 uh, uh, Ballistic missiles landed in different parts of Israel, uh, leaving very, very negligible uh, damage. And one, uh, apparently one uh, uh, girl, Bedouin girl that was injured and some couple of dozens of people who suffered anxiety following this uh, attack. Before I will talk about the uh, ramifications of that attack, the possible scenarios ahead and so on, I would like to frame this whole thing because it's enormously significant to understand the general framing. I'll, I'll try to do it in the next couple of minutes. The Mullah regime that came to power in Tehran in 1979, inspired by a very revolutionary and radical ideology, seeks to position itself as the superpower of the Middle East. As part of this master plan, the Mullah regime also vows to eliminate the state of Israel. Advancing its hegemonic vision plan, known also as the Shiite Crescent, in the last couple of decades, the Mullah regime has been quite successfully building a network of proxies, armies of terror across the Middle East, starting from Gaza Strip, where you have Hamas and Islamic Jihad, and then going through Lebanon, shape of Hezbollah in Lebanon, in Syria, where the Mullah regime practically has direct control over parts of Syria, including the presence of Pakistani, Afghan, and Iraqi Shiite militias, as well as Hezbollah's militias in Syria, participating or cooperating with Assad regime, going through Iraq, where the Mullah regime has also an array of uh, local Iraqi Shiite militias that are uh, guided by the Mullah regime in Tehran and ending up in Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen that has been recently in the center of media news uh, because of their constant attacks both against, against Israel in the last couple of months and against maritime global trade in the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandeb trade. A very significant component in the Mullah regime axis of resistance, as it's called, namely this area of armies of terror that the Mullah regime has been deployed, armed, financed across the Middle East, is the concept that is known by the name of the Ring of Fire. If you wish, this is the blueprint for the elimination of the state of Israel through the use of conventional weapons. At the core of this the master plan is the simple idea that the Iranian-backed militias, namely Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Iraqi Shiite militias, and others who are present in Syria, Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza Strip, that forms the immediate circles that borders physically Israel, they will uh, join hand together and simultaneously when the day will come, they will attack Israel from all directions of course, using the Iranian weapons they have in their possessions. And they will be backed by a secondary circle of the Iraqi Shiite militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen. And by doing that, joining hands together, they will eliminate the state of Israel. This is a concept that is rather known by the name of unifying of the arenas, or in Arabic, Wahdat al-Sahat. When Hamas, one of Iranian's proxies in the region, launched this October 7 attack on Israel, he was under the impression that the day of unifying of the arenas has come. And this is the day that, at least in the eyes of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, was supposed to be 
the day where all the militias are joining hands together to eliminate the state of Israel. Understanding the concept of the ring of fire, Israel has been operating for the last couple of years, attacking hundreds of times. The Iranian attempts to establish a military significant infrastructure, particularly in Syria, in all parts of Syria. The Iranian infrastructure in Syria, namely deposits of missiles, rockets, anti-aerial um, capacities, intelligence gathering capacities, and other capacities, military capa capacities developed and provided by the Mullah regime, aimed in the end of the day to be a cornerstone in this whole structure of the unifying of arenas master a plan of the Iranians to eliminate the state of Israel. Therefore, Israel has been attacking hundreds of times uh, the Iranian regime, particularly focusing in Syria, to intercept, to disintegrate the Iranian master plan of uh, unifying the arenas and the ring of fire. Following October 7th, the Mullah regime has been facing a dilemma how to save the rule of Hamas in Gaza Strip from falling down. As you all know, uh, it's now six months and more than six months then since the war started, Israel is deeply operating in Gaza Strip, gradually dismantling Hamas and Islamic Jihad military capacities and threatening to end Hamas rule in Gaza Strip. This is a bad news to the Mullah regime because Hamas and Islamic Jihad are very significant subcontractor in the service of the Mullah regime, in the service of the Mullah regime's master plan of unifying of the arenas, in the service of the Mullah's regime master plan of the Ring of Fire, and in the service of the Mullah's regime overhaul arching uh, uh, program to become the dominant superpower in the Middle East. So since day one of this war, the Mullah regime has been contemplating what is the right way to try and to save Hamas rule from falling down in Gaza Strip. The tactic that was up until now chosen by the Mullah regime and applied by the Mullah regime is to gradually activate its different proxies across the Middle East. Hezbollah, Iraqi Shiite militias, the Houthis in Yemen, and those proxies, proxies have been attacking constantly both Israel as well, United States military presence in Syria, in Iraq, in Jordan, the Houthis in Yemen are attacking maritime in the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandab Strait, already presenting a growing challenge to global trade. And the overarching interest of the Mura regime by applying that tactic is to apply pressure through those attacks on the United States and the international community. So they will put pressure on Israel to stop the war in Gaza Strip, and by that, the Mullah regime hopes to save Hamas rule in Gaza Strip without being dragged into a direct military collision with Israel. However, as this war continues and lingers in Gaza Strip, and Hamas and Islamic Jihad are more and more crushed by Israeli military power, and simultaneously, Israel has been continuing and increasing its attacks on Iranian interests in Syria, the Iranian dilemma further deepened and increased. In the beginning of April, an attack that was attributed to Israel, though Israel claimed no responsibility for that attack, an attack attributed to Israel in Damascus in Syria, charged the life of senior generals and senior leadership of Islamic Revolutionary Guards that were gathering in Damascus. That was a massive blow to the Mullah regime because that specific group of people were directly involved in guiding, mastering, and coordinating the whole work of the proxies of the Iranians following, before and particularly following, October 7th. And ever since then, the Mullah regime has been vowing to take a revenge, allegedly. I will shortly explain why do I say allegedly and why is it important to understand in the context of our discussion today.
the common discussion in the West vis-a-vis -vis the whole story of the um, Iranian attack in, on Israel last night basically attributed that to the concept of revenge. This is a mistake. This is not a revenge. This is a very well calculated Iranian move that basically has a very clear strategic objective. And the objective of the Iranian by carrying out this attack is to reestablish their deterrence capacity. When we go back and talking about the whole issue of the Iranian regime Shiite crescent vision, when we talk about the whole Iranian regime master plan of becoming the master power, the superpower that leads the Middle East, when we talk about the Iranian regime master plan to eliminate the state of Israel, an enormously significant cornerstone in this whole master plan is the deterrence capacity and the ability to project deterrence. That ability of the Mullah regime has been significantly compromised and eroded, and particularly October, following October 7, and therefore there has been a significant inner decision of the Mullah regime to launch this attack. The Mullah regime is a very sophisticated regime. It does not operate based upon any emotions. It, based, it operates based upon what the Mullah regime itself defines a strategic patience. There is another reason to believe that other factor that is involved in the Iranian Mullah regime to set this attack is the evaluation of the Mullah regime that there will be no severe repercussions to that attack and that estimation probably stems from the evaluation of the Mullah regime that the United States of America will prefer not to be dragged into a regional war. That insight that I provide you right now with basically is based upon a couple of facts on the ground. First is the fact that there has been an accumulating clear information days before the attack that this attack is imminent. In other words, United States and Israel had enough time to prepare for that attack. Obviously, the sources of the knowledge about the upcoming attack were no other than Iran itself. The other fact is that when the attack took place, simultaneously, some of the Iranian proxies, namely the Iraqi Shiite militias and the Houthis, I would say symbolically joined the attack. But it's interesting to notice that the two major players in the Iranian house of cards Assad regime in Damascus and Hezbollah in Lebanon, to a large extent, basically remained on the sideline. As a fact, Syria remained totally calm. There was no attack coming from Syria during the Iranian attack last night on Israel. And Hezbollah continued its very same model of very restrained, confined attacks since October 7, focusing on Israel's northern border, focusing on the Golan Heights, very carefully not exceeding or expanding the volume of its attacks. And of course, this is not by chance. The underlying Iranian order, if you wish, was for those, these two major players is to basically stay out because the Iranian would not like to jeopardize a situation of a deterioration where its two most valuable players, Assad regime in Syria and Hezbollah in Lebanon, will be dragged into a whole out massive war with Israel. The successful interception of the Iranian attack provides Israel and the United States with a couple of achievements. First, and I think very significant one, is the fact that given the fact that Israel and the United States and other allies were able to successfully intercept. 99% of that attack was totally intercepted. Basically allow Israel and the United States a wide space of maneuvering, calculating their next steps. In other words, had, had the attack not been intercepted successfully as it was, had God forbid, the outcome of launching hundreds of missiles, rockets, and attacking drones on Israel would have been totally different. 
this region would have been now dragged into a regional war. So the successful interception of the Iranian attack allow Israel and the United States time and space to calculate their upcoming steps. This is one achievement. The other achievement is that it has further emphasized the growing interest of the creation of an axis in the Middle East, which includes major Arab states, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, all of whom are severely threatened by the Iranian regime, together with Israel and the United States, to confront the growing Iranian threat. Another significant uh, achievement in the context of the successful interception of the Iranian attack is the fact that it has been re-establishing the role and position of the United States of America as a leading power. It has re-established its declining image. We have to remember that in the last couple of years, given to the very wavering US policies of the different US policy, US policy administrations vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian threat, there has been an ongoing constant process of ero eroding uh, in the sense of both US projection of power, and not less important, there has been a growing suspicious question marks by the US allies in the region to what extent they can rely on the United States of America. Reminding you that in 2019, Iran launched a direct attack, not in the same scale that we saw last night, much smaller attack on Saudi Arabia, severely damaging the Saudi oil manufacturing capacities. Following that attack, there has been no response by the United States, and that caused an enormous suspicious and a distrust among United States allies in the region. So last night, clear uh, standing together of the United States with Israel and other major countries that are interested in stopping the Iranian aggression, to a large extent help to restore the United States image uh, in, in the region, and of course, particularly in the context of its relation with its local areas. However, this is, as significant it is, this achievement has to be viewed currently in the tactic level. It has a potential to be also an enormously significant strategic achievement. One of the major questions that has to be asked, of course, and it's being asked, is what is going to be Israel's response? In the last, of course, 24 hours, as we all know, there has been a lot of contemplation and speculations about possible Israeli reaction uh, to the Iranian attack. To the best of my understanding and reading at this point, I would say these are the guiding principles that are basically shaping Israel's policy vis-a-vis -vis possible um, uh, reaction to the Iranian attack. One is the fact that in the end of the day, that attack was very successfully intercepted, 99% interception. The other thing is the fact that the United States of America sends quite clear message basically saying, we would not like to see further escalation and deterioration. This is a message that the Israeli policymakers are very much tuned to, or should I say more accurately, the relevant Israeli policymakers are very much tuned to. The third thing that also plays a significant role in shaping the possible Israeli retaliation slash reaction to the Iranian attack has to be viewed in the context of Gaza Strip, reminding us all, we are now 190 days into the war in Gaza Strip. Up until now, Israel has been prioritizing that war in Gaza Strip and the objective of bringing back the hostages, eliminating Hamas military power, and ending Hamas rule in Gaza Strip. 
on the one hand, dragging into a massive war with Iran could serve Israel's interest in the sense that it basically will be addressing as some Israeli politicians have described as hitting the head of the snake, namely the Iranian regime. On the other hand, by doing that, that could play directly to the hands of Hamas and Islamic Jihad, very possibly resulting in a situation where the current um, um, identification and solidarity of uh, the world's powers with Israel that has been attacked will very quickly change skin and will become a criticism on the state of Israel. So when you are trying to assess what is possible Israeli reaction, is it something that is really out there uh, on the table for discussion? I would say at this point that my evaluation, and again, listening very carefully also to the messages coming from senior Israeli policymaker is that Israel is very much tuned to the messages of the United States, namely the interest not to be dragged into a further escalation. Israel still keeps the concept of prioritizing the war in Gaza Strip. Next to that, we have to remember that Israel has a relatively speaking wide menu of possible ways to act following the Iranian attack. Therefore, in my evaluation, an Israeli action is not something that is totally out of the discussion. However, I would expect that an Israeli action that's very likely to take place at some form will be very much guided by those lines that I just mentioned before. I've mentioned earlier the issue of the story of the war in Gaza, and I need to re-emphasize and talk about it in the context of the Iranian attack. The region is looking. The Middle East is looking. And one of the most significant things to understand about the Middle East is not the reality, but the way the reality is being viewed and perceived by different players in the region. Right now, I can tell you today, and I've been screening with my many Arab sources, the reactions, the reactions are mixed. Some of the reactions are basically saying, well, the Iranian regime is proven to be a tiger of paper. Some of the reactions says, well, the Iranian regime by attacking, by defying, quote unquote, the U.S. warning, reminding you President Biden sent a very clear message to the Iranian regime saying, don't. Well, they did. So some circles in the Arab world are basically saying by doing that, the Iranian regime has demonstrated its ability and willingness to go all the way to secure its strategic interest, namely becoming the dominant superpower in the region. So in the context of perception, which is not less significant than reality itself in the discussion in the Middle East, it's enormously important to make sure that this specific episode will not take away the attention and the focus on a very strategic and important objective of the war in Gaza. An objective that was set simultaneously eye to eye by Israel and the Biden administration, and I can tell you is totally backed by the major Arab states who are being threatened by the Iranian regime. And that objective is to end Hamas ability to continue and to dictate its agenda on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In order to do that, we need to maintain two axes of action that are already out there on the ground. One is to continue and to eliminate Hamas and Islamic Jihad military capacities in Gaza Strip and elsewhere. This is what Israel has been doing for the last couple of months, including the ramifications in the context of the story of Rafah. I would anticipate that Israel would expect the United States of America that in return for Israel's self-restraint following the Iranian attack, the United States of America will be much more understanding about Israel's need to finish the job in Rafah. The other thing that I think that has to be taken into consideration is the what should be the proactive involvement of major Arab states 
in creation of the conditions in Gaza Strip that will make sure that Gaza Strip will not be any longer the exclusive play playground of Hamas as it has been so far. I have been emphasizing in all of my briefings, lectures, interviews, I just concluded a seven week intensive lecture to, to the United States. Hamas is not going to disappear. The idea here is not to eliminate Hamas. The idea here is in the end of the day to restrict Hamas ability to continue and dictate its radical agenda as it was unfortunately happening uh, was able to do up until now, because by doing that, Hamas is actually executing the Iranians master plan of becoming the superpower in the region. And that brings us to the most significant overall arching strategic interest of the United States, Israel, the region and beyond the region. The Iranian regime plan to become the superpower in the Middle East. That plan has to be decisively confronted and intercepted because failing to do that will bring us to a further escalation in the region. For the last decade, in my work, in my interviews, in my articles, in my books, including my recent one that was published in 2022, I have been time and again warning about the fact that continuing to ignore the Iranian master plan of becoming the superpower in the region, continuing to avoid confronting decisively the Iranian ambition will result more death, havoc and destruction. This is what happened on the ground. And I have been specifically saying that it will result in an Israeli-Iranian direct military uh, collision. This is what happened right now. Last night, the region was very close to a whole out regional war. As of now, it seems that this scenario has been distanced somewhat. But I have to re-emphasize, October 7, Hamas attack on Israel was a very significant wake up call to the world. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, the world very quickly forgot about October 7. Last night, Iranian attack on Israel is yet another significant wake up call. Ignoring that, for the, th for the next time, it may be a too late wake-up call. Thank you for joining this session. You are very welcome, of course, to follow our work in our website. And of course, uh, you are very welcome to uh, pose your questions in the uh, uh, location right here. And we will try to address your question in our upcoming session. Thank you for joining in. Shalom from Israel.